A very good evening aspirants. I have an important news to share with you. Three exciting opportunities are knocking on your doors to assist you in achieving your dream of clearing the UPSC Civil Services examination. We are here to help you in your prelims and mains preparation. Those who have missed to enroll into the most reliable prelims test series offered by Shankar IAS Academy, your wait is over. Pre-storming batch 3 is starting on November 9th. The first test in this batch will commence on 20th November. Like the other batches, it will also have 66 tests. Now for the mains examination, you all are aware about the mains booster 2023 under which you will be provided 40 mains oriented tests in 90 days. The booster is a quick plan drafted for you to boost your mains score. It starts on October 31st and will include sectional tests, half papers and civil service examination emulators. It is available in both online and offline modes for just 4,500 rupees. And on top of that, we are launching a new initiative called SA Augmenta 2023. Under this initiative, you will be provided with four tests to enhance your essays. It is also available in both online and offline modes. You will get a different approach towards essay writing along with pre-essay and post-essay discussions. To further enhance the content of essays, you will be provided with the summarized essay material combined with mentorship. And all these are just for 6,000 rupees. And grab these opportunities to kickstart your prelims and mains examination. And with this note, let us get into the Daily Hindi News Analysis for the date 29th of October 2022. And displayed here are the list of articles that we are going to discuss today. Without any delay, let's get into the article discussion. We are going to start our discussion with this article here. It says that soon a 3.5 km long rope car line would be launched along the Marina Beach in Chennai. See, the article also says that the rope car project will be launched after obtaining the coastal regulation zone clearance. And this is about the news article given here. In this context, we are going to quickly revise about the CRZ. See, in the year 1991, the Union Ministry of Environment notified the coastal regulation zone notification. So, what does the notification do? See, it declares certain coastal stretches as coastal regulation zone under section 3 of Environment Protection Act 1986. So, this is about the coastal regulation zone notification. See, largely the CRZ area is based on the high tide line. High tide line means the line on the land up to which the highest water line reaches during the spring tide. See, this HTL, which is the short form of high tide line, is demarcated by the National Centre for Sustainable Coast Management. Now, look at this image here. Here, the red line is high tide line and the blue line is low tide line. So, the low tide line is nothing but the lowest level up to which the water reaches during the spring tide. Now, with this basics, let us see about the different zonations in CRZ. First of all, we are going to see CRZ 1. It includes areas between low tide line and high tide line and it also includes areas that are ecologically sensitive and important such as national parks, marine parks, sanctuaries, reserve forests, wildlife habitats, mangroves, coral reefs, etc. And it also includes areas which are closer to breeding and spawning grounds of fish. And it also includes areas of historical importance. See, all these areas, they come under CRZ1. And these areas are the most protected area. In this zone, no new construction will be permitted except for the projects relating to the Department of Atomic Energy and construction of Trans Harbour Sea Link and Roads. So, this is the exception. Now, apart from this, you should know that if an area that comes under CRZ1 is not an eco-sensitive zone, then the exploration and extraction of natural gas, salt harvesting and desalination plants are also allowed. So, this is also an exception. But the condition is the area under CRZ1 should not be an eco-sensitive zone. And only then these activities are allowed. Now, moving on to the next zone, which is CRZ2. 
Now look at this image here. Here, CRZ2 is highlighted in the orange color. This includes area landward of high tide line, which includes the areas that are already developed. See, the crucial point here is it includes areas that are landward of high tide line. So, it extends from the sea towards the land. See, here developed area is referred to as that area within the municipal limits or in other legally designated urban areas, which is already substantially built up. See, what does this mean? This means that these developed areas, they have already been provided with drainage, approach roads and other infrastructural facilities such as water supply, sewerage, etc. See, here no new construction shall be made on the seaward side. See, we saw that the area under CRZ2 extends from high tide line towards the land. So, what activity is prohibited here? New construction is not allowed on the seaward side, which is towards the sea. And then, reconstruction of authorized building will be permitted only if it adheres to the FSI norms. Here, FSI is nothing but floor space index. Now, that is all about the CRZ2. Now, coming to CRZ3, see, this includes areas that are relatively undisturbed and those which do not belong to either Category 1 or Category 2. See, in this image, CRZ3 is highlighted in red color here. Now, as you can see, it is subdivided into two areas. The first area is 200 meter landward of the high tide line and it is called as the no development zone. See here, no construction shall be permitted except for the construction of gardens, pastures, parks, play fields, forestry and salt manufacture from seawater. Now coming to the second subdivision, it is the area between 200 meters and 500 meters landward. See here, Development of vacant plots for construction is allowed only after prior approval of states. Now, this is about CRZ3. Now, coming to the final one, which is CRZ4. See, this includes areas 12 nautical miles seaward from the low tide line. See, CRZ4 is nothing but the territorial waters of the country. See, in this area, traditional fishing is allowed, but discharge of untreated seawage is prohibited. Now, these are the different zones that are categorized under the CRZ notification. Now, finally, coming to who has the authority to give clearance. See, in the news article also, we saw that the rope car project is awaiting CRZ clearance. So, who gives this clearance? According to 2019 CRZ notification, the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change will oversee the matter of CRZ clearance only for CRZ1 and CRZ4. Do you remember what areas come under CRZ1 and CRZ4? Yeah, CRZ1 includes ecologically vulnerable areas and CRZ4 includes area between low tide line and 12 nautical miles seaward. So, for these two categories, Ministry of Environment gives the clearance. And the areas which comes under the other two categories, that is CRZ3 and CRZ2, the power of clearance has been designated at the state level. That is, the authority to give clearance has been delegated to the states. Make note of all the points that we discussed today because it is a very important topic and you can use it anywhere in your mains answer which is related to environment. And I don't have to tell you that this is an important topic for prelims as well. Make note of it, revise it again and again. Now that's all for this article discussion. In this discussion, we saw about the Coastal Regulation Zone Notification, different zonation under the CRZ notification and finally, we ended our discussion by seeing who has the authority to give CRZ clearance. Now, with these points in mind, let us move on to the next article discussion. For our next discussion, we are going to take this editorial article. See, this news article talks about the COP27, which is the United Nations Climate Summit. It opens in Egypt from November 6. See, it makes real advances to prevent the worst effects of global warming. So, in this discussion, we'll discuss about some important COP and the commitments made in it. And then, we'll discuss the need for commitments and then the issues faced by the world like the environmental issues. And after that, we'll see India's plan and various initiatives taken in the international arena. 
and finally we'll end our discussion with some way forward but before that the syllabus relevant to the article is highlighted here for your reference please go through it first of all what is cop see it stands for conference of parties it is the supreme decision making body of the united nations framework convention on climate change which is shortly referred as unfccc see all states that are parties to the convention are represented at the cop so cop is a formal meeting between the parties of the convention which is nothing but the unfccc and at this meeting they review the implementation of the convention and they also take decisions that are necessary to promote the effective implementation of the convention's objectives so this is the basics about the cop and as we saw earlier it is the supreme decision making body and we saw the states that are parties to convention meet at cop and the cop meeting happens every year see the 26th annual summit of cop was held in the year 2021 the presidency for cop 26 was taken by united kingdom and the meeting held in glasgow now with this basics let us see some important cops and the commitments made in it Firstly in the COP3 Kyoto protocol was signed and this happened in the year 1997 see this protocol legally binds the developed countries to emission reduction targets and this is one important COP then in COP8 Delhi declaration was made and this happened in the year 2002 See this declaration focused on the development needs of the poorest countries and the need for technology transfer for mitigating the climate change. Now the next important one is COP13 which was happened in the year 2007 and COP13 was held at Bali, Indonesia. See in this COP13 the parties agreed on the Bali road map and Bali action plan. See this plan charted the way towards a post 2012 outcome and the plan had five main categories they are shared vision mitigation adaptation technology and financing now coming to the next important one which is cop 16 and it happened in the year 2010 and this cop 16 resulted in the cancun agreements See these agreements are a comprehensive package by governments to assist the developing nations in dealing with the climate change and then the green climate fund technology mechanism and the cancun adaptation framework they were all established as per the cop 16 now this also is an important cop and you have to remember this and then comes the cop 21 which happened in the year 2015 See this only resulted in Paris agreement and this agreement is to limit the rising global temperature by 2 degree celsius as compared to pre industrial levels by the end of this century and also it is to continue efforts to limit the temperature increase even further to 1.5 degree celsius by the end of this century that is by 2100 so based on this target The agreement required the rich nations to maintain 100 billion dollars a year funding pledge beyond the year 2020. See this is a very important COP. Remember this Paris agreement is a result of COP 21 which happened in the year 2015. And after this comes the Marrakech Partnership for Climate Action. See this was launched in the year 2016 in COP 22. See this partnership is to move forward on writing the rule book for the Paris agreement and after this comes the COP23 which happened in the year 2017 and here countries continue to negotiate the final details of how the Paris agreement will work from 2020 onwards and in the year 2018 in COP24 the rule book to operationalize the 2015 Paris agreement was finalized See the rule book covers climate financing facilities and the actions to be taken as per the nationally determined contributions which is shortly referred as NDC. Now this is about the brief of important COPs of the convention UNFCCC. Now with this information let us see what are all the issues faced by the world regarding these climate actions. Firstly take the case of rich countries See they are still unwilling 
to compensate for the past excesses. See, they are not willing to do massive financing that the developing economies need for climate action. See, why we are concentrating on developed economies here? Because they are among the top five emitters of greenhouse gases, which comes as a result of burning of fossil fuels. Now, to know that, you should know the top five emitters of the greenhouse gases. Now, who all comes under the top five? They include China, United States, India, Russia and Japan. As you can see, when it comes to other issues like COVID-19, the rich countries were able to mobilize the finance needed. But when it comes to climate change, rich countries are failing to make up even the $100 billion annually, which is the UN goal in climate finance for developing countries. So this is one issue. Lack of interest to take actions regarding climate change by developed countries. And secondly, the plans of these countries are inadequate for reaching carbon neutrality by 2050. So from this, we can say that it is not enough to keep the temperature rise below 2 degrees Celsius as envisaged in Paris Agreement. So this is one issue, which is inadequacy of plans. And these are the two major issues that the author is talking about in this editorial. Now coming to India, see India's reliance on fossil fuel is extremely high even now. If the consumption of fossil fuel is very high, then what can be done about the net zero target? Do you all remember net zero target? What is it? See, net zero is a state in which a country's emission are compensated by absorption and removal of greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. Now you may ask, how can carbon dioxide, that too released carbon dioxide can be observed? It is very easy. See, absorption is done by creating some carbon sinks such as forest, while removal requires future technologies like carbon capture and storage. And therefore, achieving net zero requires a sharp shift to clean energy sources and this will impose high cost. See, why everyone is obsessing about the net zero? It is because of this reason only. See, if a country has net zero emission, it means it is becoming carbon neutral. Why one must achieve carbon neutral? See, already experts are saying that it is impossible to keep the temperature rise below 2 degrees Celsius. Only if countries act in the right way and achieve carbon neutrality, then only we can save Earth. And that is exactly why everyone is talking about net zero target. Now, what about India's net zero target? See, India has set a target date of 2070 for achieving net zero. See, with the information about India's net zero target, let us see what is China doing. See, as we all know, China is the world's leader in renewable energy. But China too is consuming a lot of fossil fuels. See, its share of coal and gas in energy production remains over 70%. This is too high. And it continues to finance massive fossil fuel based infrastructure. So, this is the scenario in China. Now, what about its net zero target? See, China has announced a target date of 2060 for achieving net zero. See, we saw India's net zero target and China's net zero target. What can we infer from this? See, from both of their targets, we can easily say that their net zero target is far away from the Paris Agreement. Do you remember the issues that we discussed? The first one is lack of interest by developed countries and the second one is inadequate plans, right? See, these plans that are made by India and China, they are classic examples of inadequacy of plans. See, if they set their targets far away from the Paris Agreement, then how can we keep the temperature rise below 2 degrees Celsius? Think about it. And this is only inadequate plans. Now, apart from those two issues that we discussed earlier, there is also another issue, which is nothing but the finance for mitigation efforts. Yes, the climate projects needs to be vastly scaled up by multilateral development banks such as World Bank, Asian Development Bank, etc. If all of these issues are addressed, then we can easily mitigate the climate change. Now, what should be done? 
See, firstly, COP27 that is going to happen on November 6 would be a success if the top emitter countries who are out of the line are found and they are asked to do more. See, in simple terms, it means that COP27 should say that if you are emitting more, you should take more actions for the climate change. And secondly, reaching carbon neutrality by 2050 is the absolute minimum for all major emitters. For example, ahead of COP27, Singapore has announced that it will achieve net zero emissions by 2050. See, this is a powerful signal even if it is coming from a country with only 0.1 of the carbon footprint. So, likewise, the major emitters must also strive to achieve their net zero targets earlier. Now, how can the countries advance the net zero targets? See, this can be done by switching from fossil fuel to renewables. And lastly, the banks must scale up the climate projects. See, extensive use of markets needs to be encouraged to help the shift from high carbon consuming economy to a low carbon path. And hence, COP27 should make countries adopt the carbon pricing. See, it can be done through carbon tax on the sources of pollution. And it can also be done by eliminating the fossil fuel subsidies. See, if you look at the bar graph here, you can understand how much India is spending on its fossil fuel subsidies. If India is spending so much on the fossil fuel subsidies, then how can the net zero targets be met? So, eliminating fossil fuel subsidy is a must. And as we saw earlier, if these are done, and if multilateral development banks such as World Bank and Asian Development Bank are supporting climate projects which enables the global economy to shift to a low carbon path, then all of the climate change consequences can be mitigated. So, we can conclude this discussion by saying that this COP27 which is to be held in Egypt is a chance for the country to strongly support the environmentally sustainable development of the country. Now, that's all for this article discussion. In this discussion, we saw about the important COPs and the commitments made in it. And we also saw the issues in addressing the climate change and the steps that needs to be taken to mitigate the climate change. Now, with these points in mind, let us move on to the next article discussion. Now, see this news article here. It is about the recently released draft Indian Telecommunication Act. As we all know, the government placed the draft Indian Telecommunication Act for public review. And based on this draft, the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Information and Technology raised several questions. And it has raised questions regarding some vague terms like national security and public interest. See, the committee expressed that using this loophole, the government might infringe on the privacy of the citizen. And this is the crux of the news article given here. See, as we have already covered the draft Indian Telecommunication Act in our previous analysis, today we'll focus on the static part which is the parliamentary committee. So, what is this parliamentary committee? A parliamentary committee is a panel of MPs. We all know what is MP, right? It is the member of the parliament. See, these MPs, they are appointed or elected by the parliament or they may be nominated by speaker or chairman. And this parliamentary committee works under the direction of speaker or chairman, that is the presiding officer of Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha respectively. And this committee presents its report to the parliament, that is the Lok Sabha or Rajya Sabha, or to the speaker or to the chairman. And this is about the basics of parliamentary committee. It consists of MPs, they may be either appointed or elected or nominated. They work under the direction of the presiding officer of the houses and they report to the houses or the presiding officers of the houses. Now, let us see why parliamentary committees are established. Firstly, parliament, it is a very large body. So, to get through debate and to arrive at a decision takes time. And that is exactly why parliamentary committees are established. So, parliamentary committee, it works on certain things and it presents its report to the parliament which can be discussed in the parliament. And secondly, in some cases, the parliament may lack expertise. 
and in that case is also parliamentary committees comes in handy so basically parliamentary committees are an instrument of parliament for the parliament's own effective functioning and these are the reasons why parliamentary committees are established now where did the concept of parliamentary committee originate see parliamentary committees have their origins in the british parliament The first parliamentary committee was constituted in 1571 in Britain. In India, the first public accounts committee, which is one of the three financial committees, was constituted in April 1950. See the parliamentary committees, they draw their authority from Article 105 and Article 118. Article 105 deals with the privileges of the member of the parliament and Article 118 gives the parliament authority to make rules to regulate its procedure and conduct of business so this is about the basics of the parliamentary committee now moving on to the types of the parliamentary committees see basically parliamentary committees are classified into standing and ad hoc committees see the standing committees are constituted every year or it may be constituted periodically periodically in the sense say for 2 years or 5 years etc Remember these standing committees they are permanent and work on a continuous basis while the ad hoc committees they are temporary and they cease to exist on completion of the task assigned to them now what did we see in the news today in the news today we saw about the committee on information and technology and it is one of the 24 departmental standing committees and the standing committees are again categorized into financial committees departmental standing committees committees to enquire committees to scrutinize committees relating to the day to day business of the house and housekeeping committees or service committees so this is by and large the holistic classification of parliamentary committees now finally we are going to discuss about the significance of the parliamentary committees See firstly parliamentary committees ensure proper discussion on various subjects see most of the time the mps do not get adequate time to put forward their views in parliament but in the case of parliamentary committees every mp gets a chance and time to contribute to the discussion and in addition to this parliament has only around 100 sittings a year on the other hand the parliamentary committee meetings are independent of the parliament's calendar so proper discussion takes place this is one significance of parliamentary committee now secondly there is no party politics in parliamentary committees see this is because the discussions that happen in the parliamentary committees are confidential and they are off camera so mps are able to speak their minds in the committee meeting and some mps or even of the opinion that the real discussion happens only in the parliamentary committees and this is the second significance and finally the parliamentary committees ensure interministry coordination see this is because committees work closely with multiple ministries so the bills that are referred to the committees often return to the house with significant value addition so these are some of the significances of parliamentary committees now with this we have also come to the end of this particular article discussion in this discussion we saw about parliamentary committee the need for the establishment of parliamentary committee its types and finally we ended our discussion by seeing its significance now with these points in mind let us move on to the next article discussion see this news article here it talks about the grievance appellate committees See these committees are to be established based on the recent amendment made by the center to the information technology intermediary guidelines and digital media ethics code rules 2021 See according to the recent amendment the central government may by notification establish one or more grievance appellate committees within 3 months So this is the amendment made by the center to the information technology rules See this is about the news article given here. In this discussion we'll briefly see about the grievance appellate committees. But before that let us see a bit of background to understand it better. See the Information Technology Rules 2021 mandated the social media companies like Facebook, Twitter to appoint India based resident grievance officers. 
See, these officers are responsible for overseeing the grievance redressal mechanism of complaints from the people who use the services. Here, when I say services, I mean Facebook, Twitter, and other social media. So, what does this mean? It means that if a user has an issue with an account or a piece of content on a social media platform, then they can complain about it to the company's grievance officer. And it is the duty of this grievance officer to act and dispose of that complaint within 15 days. But what if the decision of the grievance officer is not satisfactory to the user? Can the user appeal against the decision of the grievance officer? See, earlier, the user can appeal against the decision of the grievance officer in the court. But since our courts are already overburdened, the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology recently amended the Information Technology Rules 2021. See, this amendment was done to aid in the establishment of Grievance Appellate Committee. So, basically, the Grievance Appellate Committee is set up to provide an alternative to a user to file an appeal against the decision of the grievance officer rather than going to the court of law. See, each Grievance Appellate Committee will have a chairperson and two whole-time members appointed by the union government. And if a user is not satisfied with the ruling of the grievance officer, he can apply to the grievance appellate committee within a period of 30 days. And the committee should resolve the appeal made by the user within 30 days. To arrive at a decision, the committee can take the assistance from people with necessary qualifications and experience on the subject matter. See, the dispute resolution adopted by the GAC will be digital in nature. So, the appeal against the order of the grievance officer can be made online and the order issued by the committee will also be made available online. See, the social media intermediaries must comply with the orders of the committee and a report highlighting the steps taken by the social media intermediaries should be updated in their website. And this is about the grievance officers and grievances appellate committee. Take note of these points that we discussed now. See, it is very useful for your prelims. What if a statement comes in your prelims stating that the decision of the grievance officer of the social media companies are final? Then you must know that that statement is incorrect. The user can appeal against the decision of the grievance officer to the grievance appellate committee and it is established by the union government. Now, with these points in mind, let us move on to the next article discussion. Now, look at this news article here. See, this news article talks about the avian flu outbreak in Kutanadu, Kerala. Note that this latest case is the fifth outbreak of avian influenza in the region in the past eight years. See, the variants like H5N8, H5N1 are causing the ducks in the region to die. So, this is the crux of the news article given here. In this context, let us discuss about the avian flu in detail. See, avian influenza is also known as bird flu. It refers to the infection of birds with avian influenza type A viruses. It is very contagious among birds. See, these viruses, they naturally spread among wild aquatic birds worldwide. Here, wild aquatic birds include water birds, Waterfowl such as ducks, geese, swans, gulls, terns and shorebirds. Apart from this, also know that influenza A viruses have been detected and are known to circulate in seven different animal species or groups. And this includes domestic poultry, other bird species, swine, horses, dogs and bats. Now, this is about the basics of the avian influenza, which is also known as bird flu. Now, coming to the types, see, there are four types of influenza virus. They include type A, B, C and D. Just look at this table. This table contains the different influenza viruses and their nature. Influenza A, it infects a wide range of animals, including birds. And B, it mainly infects humans. Now, coming to C, it infects humans and pigs, but it is more rare than type A and B. Now, coming to influenza D, it infects cattle. So, these are the types. 
Now, depending on the host, where it origins, influenza A viruses can be classified as avian influenza, swine influenza, or other types of animal influenza viruses. For example, avian influenza is otherwise called as bird flu. And this virus have subtypes such as H5N1, H9N2. And there is also swine influenza which is also called as swine flu and this virus has subtypes such as H1N1 and H3N2. See all of these animal influenza type A viruses are distinct from human influenza viruses and they do not easily transmit among humans. But know that still there is a chance of transmission from animals to humans. Now these are all the types of influenza. Firstly, we saw the broad classification and after that we saw the classification which depends on the host where it origins. Now apart from these classification, there are also subtypes of influenza virus A based on the two proteins that the virus have on their surfaces. See what are those two proteins? One is hemagglutinin which is denoted by capital H and the other one is neuraminidase which is denoted by capital N. See, on the whole, there are 18 different hemagglutinin subtypes and 11 different neuraminidase subtypes. So, what does this mean? The subtypes ranges from H1 through H18 and N1 through N11 respectively. See, these are known to occur in a number of different combinations. Among these different subtypes, H5 and H7 are known to include highly pathogenic viruses and particularly H5N1 is a cause for the current concern. See, H5N1 causes disease in chickens and other species of birds. And this is one perception of classification. Now, in particular, take this avian influenza virus. See, it has multiple strains or types. As we all know, COVID-19 had multiple strains and variants, right? Likewise, this avian influenza virus also has multiple strains. And these strains can be divided into two. And this is done based on its ability to cause disease in poultry. And what are the two divisions? They are highly pathogenic avian influenza and low pathogenic avian influenza. See, in this, the LPAI, which is nothing but the low pathogenic avian influenza, is a natural infection of waterfowl that may cause minimal impacts or no signs of disease in domestic poultry and wild birds. So, LPAI is not a serious threat. But on the other hand, HPAI, which is nothing but the highly pathogenic avian influenza, it is a very serious one because it causes severe disease in domestic poultry and therefore it is associated with their high death rate. But know that HPAI is rarely found in waterfall. See, to understand better, have a look at this image here. In the first type, it is the LPAI. See, the pink color represents the infected organ and it is restricted to the intestine only. But when you take the next type, that is the HPAI, the pink color, that is the infected region, is almost covering the whole bird. And now you can understand the difference of severity between HPAI and LPAI. So far, we saw about the basics of influenza, their types, and we saw the subtypes of avian influenza. Now, how this virus is transmitted? Generally, these viruses occur naturally among the wild birds. This we know already. So, where does this virus reside? See, the virus is present in the saliva, nasal secretions and feces of the infected wild birds. And the viruses spread to the other domestic birds that come in contact with these infected birds or the surfaces which are contaminated with the virus. This means open air markets where eggs and birds are sold in crowded and unsanitary conditions can lead to transmission of the virus. Now, that's all about this article discussion. In this discussion, we saw about the influenza virus and its types. And after that, we saw about different classifications of the avian influenza viruses. And finally, we ended our discussion by seeing the mode of transmission of the virus. 
Now with these points in mind, let us move on to the next part of the discussion that is the practice prelims question discussion. Today we have five prelims questions. I'll solve four of them and one of them is a quiz question for you. Now let us take this first question. Consider the following statements regarding the hunting of wild animals. Statement 1. Animals protected under Schedule 1 of Wildlife Protection Act 1972 cannot be hunted for the purpose of scientific management. And Statement 2. The killing or wounding of any wild animal in defense of oneself or any other person is not an offense under Wildlife Protection Act 1972. See, I have given this question here because of this article. See, the article says that the tiger which had triggered panic among the local residents of Kerala was captured from a human settlement. See, it was captured by a forest team led by wildlife warden. See, they set up four cages at different parts of the area and the animal walked into the trap. Now, this is the crux of the news article given here. Now, in this context, we are going to see about the hunting of wild animals and the provisions related to it that are given in the Wildlife Protection Act 1972. Whenever you talk about the hunting of wild animals, you have to remember two sections. One is Section 11 and the other one is Section 12. Section 11 consists of provisions related to hunting of wild animals that are permitted in certain cases. See, this provision says that if the chief wildlife warden feels that a wild animal which is specified in Schedule 1 has become dangerous to human life or is disabled or deceased beyond recovery, then he can permit any person to hunt such animal. But the important points that are to be noted here is that no wild animal shall be ordered to be killed unless the chief wildlife warden is satisfied that such animal cannot be captured, tranquilized or translocated. So what does this mean? The chief wildlife warden can permit any person to hunt, but that animal cannot be killed unless he is satisfied that such animal cannot be captured, tranquilized or translocated. And also note that such captured animal shall not be kept in captivity unless the chief wildlife warden is satisfied that such animal cannot be rehabilitated in the wild. Now coming to the second provision of the section 11, it also says the same thing but it is concerned about the animals that are specified in schedule 2, schedule 3 or schedule 4. See this provision is as same as the first one. See if the chief wildlife warden is satisfied that the wild animal specified in schedule 2, 3, 4 has become dangerous to human life or property. Here property includes standing crops of any land. Or if he feels that the animal is disabled or deceased beyond recovery, then he can permit any person to hunt such animal. Now, this is the second provision. Now, coming to the third one, we saw that the chief wildlife warden can permit any person to hunt animals, right? And we saw the cases for hunting also. This provision is regarding the killing or wounding of any wild animal in good faith. Now, you may ask a question. How does killing comes under good faith? See, if we are defending ourselves from any wild animal or if we are defending any other person from the wild animal, then it is good faith only, right? So, if you are killing or wounding any wild animal in good faith, then it is not an offense under Wildlife Protection Act 1972. Now, this is the third provision. Now, coming to the fourth one. Now, let us say that you are killing a wild animal or you are wounding an animal while defending any other person from that animal. Then also that wild animal that you killed belongs to government. See the provision says that wild animal killed or wounded in defense of any person shall be the government property. See these are the points that you have to remember under section 11 of Wildlife Protection Act. Now coming to section 12, it deals with the grant of permit for special purposes. So here what we are going to see, see chief wildlife warden can permit any person to hunt for certain cases or for certain purposes. So what are those purposes? He can permit any person to hunt for the purpose of education, scientific research, scientific management. See here scientific management means 
ट्रांसलोकेशन ऑफ एनी वाइल्ड एनिमल टू वन अल्टरनेट सूटेबल हैबिटेट और पॉपुलेशन मैनेजमेंट ऑफ वाइल्ड लाइफ विदाउट किलिंग और पॉइजनिंग और डिस्ट्रॉइंग एनी वाइल्ड एनिमल now apart from this he can permit any person to hunt for the collection of specimens see this is done for the recognized zoos or for museums and similar institutions now the final purpose is for derivation collection and preparation of snake venom for the manufacture of life saving drugs so for all of these purposes chief wildlife warden can permit any person to hunt here also you have to note two things one is that the chief wildlife warden can issue permit in respect of any wild animal specified in schedule 1 only with the previous permission of the central government so if you want to hunt a wild animal specified in schedule 1 for any of these purposes that we saw earlier you have to get the previous permission of the central government the other provision that you have to remember is the other wild animals that is the other animals that are not specified in the schedule 1 if you have to hunt these animals for the purposes that we saw you have to get the previous permission of the state government so these are some of the provisions that you have to remember regarding hunting of wild animals now coming to the question again statement 1 says that animals protected under schedule 1 of the wildlife protection act 1972 cannot be hunted for the purpose of scientific management see this statement is incorrect they can be hunted for the purpose of scientific management but what is the condition here they must obtain the previous permission of central government now coming to the second statement the killing or wounding of any wild animal in defense of oneself or any other person is not an offense under wildlife protection act see this statement is correct so what is the correct answer to this question the correct answer is option b two only now moving on to the next question consider the following statements regarding coastal regulation zone notification 2019 See CRZ 2019 notification is based on the recommendations of Dr Shailesh Nayak committee. See the statement is correct. It is based on the recommendations of Dr Shailesh Nayak committee only. Now coming to statement 2 2019 notification demarcated 20 meter no development zone for all the islands. See the statement is also correct. Now do you remember our discussion what did we see in our CRZ 3 we saw that there is a no development zone there also but it extends to 200 meters from the high tide line the statement here is regarding islands and this statement is correct now statement 3 it says that all crz clearance is to be given by ministry of environment forest and climate change see the statement is incorrect in our discussion itself we saw that according to 2019 crz notification the ministry of environment forest and climate change will give crz clearance only for crz 1 and crz 4 areas and for the crz 3 and crz 2 areas the state has the power of clearance so what is the correct answer here we saw that statement 1 and 2 are correct and statement 3 is incorrect so the correct answer to the question is option a 1 and 2 only now moving on to the next question With reference to public accounts committee consider the following statements the speaker of the lok sabha acts as the chairman of the committee this statement is wrong see the speaker of lok sabha does not act as the chairman of this committee the chairperson of the committee is appointed by the speaker from amongst the members of lok sabha who are elected to the committee See the Lok Sabha speaker acts as the chairman of business advisory committee general purpose committee and rules committee so he is not the chairman of the public accounts committee now coming to statement 2 the committee consists of 22 members comprising 15 members elected by Lok Sabha from amongst its members and remaining 7 members elected by Rajya Sabha from amongst its members now this statement is correct So here note that a minister cannot be a part of public accounts committee in fact a minister cannot be a member of any of the three finance committees which includes public accounts committee estimates committee and committee on the public sector undertaking minister also cannot be a part of 24 departmental standing committees so it is a crucial fact keep it in your mind revise it again and again 
Now moving on to the third statement, an important function of the committee is to ascertain that money granted by the parliament has been spent by government within the scope of the demand. This statement is correct. This is only the important function of the public accounts committee. And in addition to this, the committee also examines cases involving losses, nugatory expenditure and financial irregularities. Now coming to the last statement, government is required to take action on the recommendations contained in the reports of the committee within six months and keep it informed of the action taken or proposed to be taken in each case. And this statement is also correct. See, government has to take action and it has to keep the committee informed about the action that it has taken. So, what is the correct answer here? We saw that statement 1 is incorrect and all the other three statements are correct. So, the correct answer here is option B, 2, 3 and 4 only. Now, moving on to the next question. Consider the following statements about the Grievance Appellate Committee. Statement 1. Appeals against the orders of grievance officers are to be taken by the Grievance Appellate Committee. Statement 2. The Grievance Appellate Committees must give their order within 30 calendar days. And Statement 3. The Grievance Appellate Committee can adopt an online dispute resolution mechanism. See, all these three statements are correct. We saw these points in our discussion itself. If you have any difficulty in remembering all of these facts, go back to the Grievance Appellate Committee discussion and go through it once again. So, what is the correct answer to this question? The correct answer is option D, 1, 2, 1, 3. Now, coming to the final question. See, this is only the quiz question for you. See, it is a very easy question. Read the statements very carefully and post your answer in the comment section. And also look out for the question because it has asked for the incorrect statements. So don't get confused here. I have given a mains question here for your practice. So interested aspirants, write it and post your answer in the comment section. And if you have any queries related to the articles that we discussed today, post that also in the comment section. And don't forget about the quiz question. And with this, we have come to the end. If you find the video useful, like, share and comment and do subscribe to Shankar AS Academy's YouTube channel for further updates. Thank you.